What is Hackers and Founders and why do we care about liquidity and why is a student short so I'm talking about finance stuff? Um, who is Hackers and Founders? We started off a number of years ago with a handful of people and me in a bar just talking about startups, what's going on, this and that and the other thing. Um, we have since grown a little bit. Um, we are now the, I believe, the world's largest network of nerds building startups. Um, there have been Hackers and Founders events in 125 cities, 48 countries. Um, 300,000 people have attended our events, and um, that's still kind of our bread and butter. We're this weird kind of community-facing organization. We've taken a very kind of open source approach to the brand, and um, how do you turn hanging out in a bar into a business? That is a very, very good question. Um, and. We essentially, I found myself spending a lot of time just trying to connect people, help them out. Um, hey, you should talk with so-and-so, you should talk with so-and-so. And eventually we just formalized that process. And Hackers and Founders Co-op is what essentially emerged from that. We built a founders cooperative. Um, we provide um, growth and globalization services to companies that actually are in our portfolio. They contribute stock to a shared special purpose vehicle. They become part owners of the vehicle. We own part of the vehicle. And then part of the vehicle will actually sell off to angel investors, and that pays our bills in the short term. Um, and we have worked with about 60 companies um, through this process. Those companies are now worth about 600 million bucks. Um, and they've raised about $100 million. We've had five exits um, since then. And um, I think the process is actually going pretty well. We are, um, we've created several of these special purpose vehicles, and um, if you were to care a dollar in um, at inception and a dollar out five years later into a Russell 2000 index, um, it's not a dollar in, dollar out, full disclosure, these are not promises, but um, a dollar into one of our funds um, has actually been doing quite well, and if I'm not mistaken, those are, our first alpha class, we didn't have a fund, um, but that red line should actually be up towards 23 um, right now, because one of our companies in that portfolio is having a really significant funding event right now. Um, so anyway, um, not bad for a dude who used to be in the Arners. Um, that's what I did for 20 years before I moved to the Valley. I did go back to school and study engineering. Um, and was in the process of trying to figure out how this whole startup ecosystem actually worked in Silicon Valley. Um, and long and behold, I ended up trying to obsess about how money flows throughout the system. How does money come from pension funds, which I had as a nurse, and flow into funds of funds and then flow back into um, venture funds and then flow into startups? Um, and that seems like a lot of stops and an inefficient process for a nerd and an engineer. And so I was like, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be better ways. How do we do this? Um, and how do we help tens of thousands of startups around the globe? And oh my gosh, if we can actually solve this problem, we move the economy. Holy crap. Like you could actually grow the economy. Um, one of the interesting, so we submitted 80 pages of commentary to the SEC on crowdfunding and what that should look like for two and three person startups. Um, I believe the future of the world is two to 20 person companies. Um, and it's really hard for those two to 20 person companies to get noticed in mass. Um, it is a huge engine. Um, startups and less than 100 person companies provide 100% of all net growth in the United States. Um, all net job growth in the United States. Big companies throw off employees. Um, small companies grow employees. And so actually small companies create 150% of the new jobs, but compared to the, and big companies tend to lose more jobs than they actually create. So small businesses essentially end up creating 100% of all new net jobs. Um, and one of the first days that I was on this committee, um, we got asked because of the comments that we were submitted, um, one of the head economists at the SEC was presenting information on how much money is being raised through Reg D and blah, 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 and it's $1.3 trillion have been raised by, you know, on the private markets by companies in this sector and blah, blah, blah. And, and non-fund entities were $135 billion worth of that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yes, Jonathan? 
Non-fund entities, would that actually mean companies? Yes. So if we're the committee, advisory committee on capital formation for small and emerging businesses, do I care about any of the other stuff you just said? I should just care about that $165 billion, right? Well, no, Jonathan. I mean, there's a lot of venture funds and stuff like that and online trading platforms that actually raise money and invest in startups. Yes, Jonathan. But wouldn't when the venture fund invest in the startup, wouldn't they have to file a Reg D form? Well, yes. So wouldn't I only care about that $165 billion? Oh, you might have a point. Yes, Jonathan. Do you know how big the lottery is? No, Jonathan, I don't. Um, it's $65 billion a year. So basically we're saying that three lotteries were expecting to produce all of the jobs in the United States. Oh, uh, well, kind of have a point. Like the lottery is kind of a government investment program for like broken poor people, right? Well, yeah, and we're trying to figure out should we let poor people invest more in companies? Yeah. I don't know, it feels to me like I used to be a nurse, but it feels to me like this might be a problem and if we could fix this, we might actually have more successful companies get more capital. And then, oh, but Jonathan, liquidity. Oh, how do they actually sell their stock secondarily? It makes a lot of sense. One of the things that we're being graded on when we fundraise is liquidity, how much money we actually return to our investors. Um, we've returned a little bit. Um, over the first five years, some of those companies are growing, and we certainly hope that they have an M&A transaction, that they get acquired by a big co. But at the same time, um, how do, is, are there ways that we can do to actually improve this process? Um, I think what second market, um, excuse me, NASDAQ private markets and what Anne-Marie is doing is very interesting. I hope they push aggressively downwards or that someone would create a startup to allow something like that. Um, and I am also um, working on the bottom end. Are, like, are there more efficient ways for more startups to get more capital? Um, are there ways for us to be able to raise, you know, help even mid-sized companies actually raise money and those investors be able to make money on those investments sooner than necessarily having to wait 10 years. The reason I obsess about that is because if we solve that question, we grow the economy. And as a nerd and as an engineer, it's just a really, that'd be a really cool hack. Um, so that's us. Um, that's hackers and founders. Um, and that is why we are having this event. Um, what time is it? 156. Any questions, comments, concerns, complaints? Regarding crowdfunding, mm -hmm. how does blockchain build trust on the crowd? How does blockchain build trust on the crowd? There is, there are a number of very large investment banks that are actively trying to create a unified um, currency between themselves, like a private currency, based on the blockchain. That's really interesting. Um, how many people own Bitcoin? How many people trust that that's still going to go up? I would argue that Bitcoin is, when people read about or hear about Bitcoin in the news, they hear about a bunch of Bitcoins being stolen. Um, and they don't understand the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain. And so, broadly speaking, yes, it would be a better way. Um, Market speaking, will people in Peoria, Illinois, understand that if this transaction is whatever backed by the blockchain, that yes. Um, a lot of the worries of the government that I've been learning on the SEC aren't so much with the technology used. It's really with, um, are people, when they're selling stock, are they telling the truth? And a lot of this goes back to the 1920s and 30s and Great Depression. And it's people who used to stand up on a stool and say, I will promise you the blue sky. And they would sell stock, and then they'd call their friend in New York and say, hey, I just sold a bunch of shares at $100. So they moved up the price to $100 a share, and then the dude in New York would sell all their shares at $100, and then the stock would drop to 2 bucks a share. Um, and it was those types of really illiquid markets 
that created a lot of the rules and regulations around um, stock sales to protect poor people in Peoria. Um, the argument a lot of us make in Silicon Valley is that stuff's a lot more transparent now. Stuff happens a lot quick. Word moves a lot faster. Um, but there's still, you know, every now and then you hear of a startup on wrong, you know, some startup founder raises a bunch of money and the next thing you know, they go to, they go to Vegas and are coming back with a Lamborghini or whatever. Um, it doesn't happen that often because Silicon Valley is based on a trust-based network. Um, but globally, I think that's kind of an issue. Um, no, I, I think that there is a lot of room for improvement in this. Part of it is regulatory, large part of it is regulatory and cultural. And I've routinely been shocked how little people in DC understand even the technologies and like staffers in charge of technology for Senator Husey Wetzit is the person who was good at the Twitter during the campaign. And they're expected to understand blockchain and net neutrality and all of the you know startup finance and the market. I am the only Silicon Valley person on the SEC committee of 14 people. We are the only part of the SEC that works on how much money do startups need or small businesses need, how much should they get, who should be allowed to invest in these companies or not. And the SEC has 5,000 employees. We have one half of a full-time employee. And we are the third mandate of the SEC. Their three mandates are to um, protect investors, to maintain efficient markets, and to help capital formation. So they have half of an employee and our committee, which is all volunteers, um, on this. So it's, there's a lot of work to do. <laughs>